I was reading an academic paper earlier this week and learned a new word, finfluencer. According to Sue Guan of Santa Clara University, the term finfluencer refers to a person who, by virtue of their popular or cultural status, has an outsized impact on investor decisions through social media influence. According to Guan, a variety of finfluencers exist in today's markets, ranging from simple celebrities that draw people's attention like Kim Kardashian to corporate personalities like Elon Musk or Ryan Cohen to ordinary investors who develop followings on YouTube, TikTok, and other social media platforms. There are also actors who play the part of knowledgeable investors on TV shows who become finfluencers like Kevin O'Leary. Finfluencers are not traditional financial analysts. Instead, their audience is mostly made up of retail investors and their message, if they have one, typically focuses on democratizing finance or increasing access to information. She points out that Finfluence has long been a perfectly legal feature of stock markets and gives the example of media personality Jim Cramer, who's had a stock market analysis platform on CNBC for over 20 years. The phenomenon of Finfluencing is nothing new either. Nearly a century ago, in the lead-up to the 1929 stock market crash, an astrologer named Evangeline Adams amassed a sizable influence among investors, including celebrities like Charlie Chaplin and bankers like J.P. Morgan, doling out stock tips that she derived from star charts and astrology. At one point, she disseminated a newsletter with 100,000 subscribers. Today we still have witches baffling people with their magical powers and providing investment analysis on the internet. It's not all bad though. If you stay tuned to the very end, I'll tell you my favourite Finfluencer story of the week. Finfluencing activity has raised questions around the scope of the laws relating to investment fraud and stock manipulation too. In an early Finfluencing case in 2000, the SEC settled a case with a 15-year-old boy, Jonathan Labed, regarding a stock market manipulation scheme in which he pumped and dumped thinly traded microcap stocks on the Yahoo Finance message boards. Labed found that using exclamation marks and capital letters made his messages seem more exciting online, enabling him to generate more in interest. Since then, YouTubers have worked out that bright yellow text and question marks work even better. The Labed case led to questions about the scope of stock market manipulation prohibitions. As one commentator noted at the time, making stock price predictions without basis for those predictions sounds a lot like what happens on Wall Street every day. Financial advice can be quite expensive, and the reason for this is that good financial advice is typically quite tailored to an individual's financial situation, their risk tolerance and their financial goals, all of which need to be fully understood by an advisor before they can offer advice. Because of this expense, many people turn to personal financial advice gurus and online finfluencers for advice. The personal finance space is huge. Robert Kiyosaki's book, Rich Dad Poor Dad, has sold 32 million copies since 1997. Dave Ramsey's book, Total Money Makeover, has sold one and a half million copies since 2013, and his website claims that his radio show attracts 18 million listeners per week. For my younger viewers, radio is sort of an old-fashioned type of podcast. You'll have seen radios in older cars filling the little spot where the touchscreen is supposed to be. Uh, ask your parents about it. They'll, they'll explain. Anyhow, personal finance media personalities are significantly more influential than academics. People really listen to them. A 2021 paper by Felix Chopra found that exposure to Dave Ramsey's radio show, which promotes high savings rates, reduces household retail spending by at least 5.4%. 
According to James Choi, a finance professor at Yale University, the advice given by popular personal finance authors is often quite different to the advice coming from academia. Choi was asked a few years ago to teach an undergrad class in personal finance, and to prepare, he dug into the popular financial self-help books to see what advice Finfluencers were given. He later went on to analyse the 50 most popular personal finance books and found that what academics advised was often very different to what tens of millions of readers were being told by popular financial gurus. There was plenty of agreement. Most popular financial authors recommend low-cost passive index funds, and most financial academics advise the same. But Choi found more differences than similarities. Now, before I dig into his findings, let me tell you about today's video sponsor, Aura. Digital privacy becomes more important as every day goes by. Identity theft is becoming more and more of an issue, and your data is constantly at risk. Aura provides all-in-one digital privacy protection, giving you rapid fraud alerts, VPN protection, virus protection, a password manager, and more. Have you ever Googled yourself and were shocked to see your personal information exposed on one of those public listing sites? Aura can identify data brokers exposing your information and submit opt-out requests on your behalf. Data brokers are legally required to remove your information if you ask them to, but they make it super hard to do so. Let Aura handle it for you instead. You can try Aura for free for two weeks using my link, aura.com forward slash Patrick. It's really easy to set up, so you don't have to download several different apps to get things like parental controls, antivirus, VPN, password management, identity theft, insurance, and more. You can get all of this at one affordable price. Let Aura do the hard work of keeping you safe online so you can focus on other tasks with peace of mind. Go to aura.com forward slash Patrick to start your two week free trial. You can do this by just clicking on the link in the video description below. Now, Choi starts out his paper by pointing out that understanding popular personal financial advice is valuable within academia for a number of reasons. First, it means that academics can better understand the actual financial decisions that people make if they know more about the advice that these people have been given. Second, he argues that popular financial advice might contain important insights that academics have been overlooking. Third, he says that even if popular financial advice is not exactly optimal, it may still make sense for people to follow it if the advice takes into account the constraints faced by regular people. For example, popular advice might try to take into account and work around the limited willpower individuals have to stick to a financial plan. Choi analyzed the advice on things like optimal savings rates, strategies for dealing with debt, asset allocation, international diversification, and advice on mortgage choices. These are most of the big financial decisions that most people make in their lives. So what are the differences that he found, and who's right, the Finfluencers or the academics? Well, the answer, of course, depends on the Finfluencer in question and the academic. Some Finfluencers give sensible advice, while others pitch risky get-rich-quick schemes or the power of positive thinking. Some barely offer any coherent financial advice at all. But even the most practical personal finance books depart significantly from the optimal solutions calculated by economists. On the topic of saving and spending, economists typically advise that people should smooth consumption over their life cycle, spending money while they're young, piling up savings in their peak earning years, and then spending that accumulated wealth in retirement. This advice is based on the fact that for most people, income tends to be hump-shaped with respect to age. Savings rates should on average be low or negative early in life, 
high in midlife and negative during retirement. In contrast to the emphasis on evening out consumption over your life that's found in economic theory, popular authors advise constant percentage savings rates, which happen to also be the default option for typical retirement saving plans. Tony Robbins, for example, advises that whatever your savings percentage number is, you have to stick to it in good times and bad, no matter what. Why? Because the laws of compounding punish even one missed contribution. Only one popular author argued that the advice to save 10% of your income essentially endorses the constant expanding and contracting of family expenditures as your income rises and falls, but that life is easier and more enjoyable if spending always stays on average at a modest level. Popular authors tend to champion simple savings rules that have the virtue of requiring very few calculations. 21 of the 50 books recommend a positive savings rate that does not vary by age. Most of the books recommended saving 10 to 15% of your income. Four books recommended 20% or a range that includes 20%, and two recommended 50% or more on the premise that you should have the financial freedom to be able to walk away from an undesirable job early in life. Only one of the books adjusts your savings rate for the amount you have already saved. Nine books advise starting with a target for wealth at retirement in order to calculate the necessary savings rate. Only four books recommend taking social security benefits into account when choosing a savings rate, despite the fact that social security replaces 64% of final working life earnings for the median new beneficiary aged 64 to 66 in 2005. 15 books recommend increasing your savings rate over time. If income is rising over time, this strategy is consistent with the academic idea of consumption smoothing. Three of the books recommend increasing your savings rate by 1% of income per month over the next few months, faster than plausible income growth for most people. And this was done on the theory that you can get used to a higher savings rate over time. Eight books say that a lower level of spending becomes easier to tolerate with the passage of time. 18 books give some variant of the advice that debt can be good when used to fund investment in things that appreciate, such as houses and human capital, but is bad otherwise. Seven books advise against student loans altogether. Standard economic theory does not involve earmarking portions of household savings for specific purposes. Money is fungible. A lot of the personal financial books advocate dividing savings into mental accounts devoted to different goals. Commonly mentioned mental accounts are a fund for emergencies, a retirement savings fund, a fund for major purchases such as a house or a car, and a fund for children's college tuition. Saving for these expenses is often on top of the earlier mentioned savings for retirement. The personal financial books argue that mental accounting increases motivation to save by making a strong link between today's savings and a specific future spending goal. They argue that this also helps people monitor whether they're on track to achieve these goals when the time comes. 20% of American households have their wealth almost entirely tied up in illiquid assets like real estate and retirement accounts, with almost no liquid cash on hand. They are described as being wealthy hand-to-mouth households. A 2001 academic paper interprets this pattern as being the result of households deliberately storing wealth in illiquid assets to protect it from their lack of self-control. The popular authors don't tend to advise this as a saving strategy. Most advise keeping a liquid emergency fund on hand. 
The academics don't advise tying your wealth up in illiquid assets either, just to be clear, but they put forth that maybe people are doing this as a way to control their impulse to spend. Fifteen of the personal financial books give specific advice on spending in retirement. Two advise planning on lower spending in retirement than during an individual's working life, whereas two books advise keeping spending constant across the retirement threshold. The books recommend spending between 3% and 8% of your wealth each year. The highest recommended spending is from Dave Ramsey at 8% on the theory that nominal investment returns will be 12% and that the inflation rate will be 4%. Most academics would have a lower expected return on investment than that. On the topic of asset allocation, meaning how much money you should put in stocks and bonds and cash, investment time horizon appears to be the main concern in popular financial advice. A common claim from the personal financial gurus is that the longer you hold stocks for, the safer they become. This is simply not true. Equities offer both more risk and more reward, whether you hold them for days or for decades. Over a long time horizon, they are more likely to outperform bonds, but they're also more likely to hit some catastrophe. Choi argues that there's little harm done by this mistake, because even if the logic is muddled, it produces reasonable investment strategies. The idea that stock market risk decreases with longer holding periods leads to popular authors recommending that stock allocations increase with investment horizon. Money is often bucketed by when it will be needed, and a different investment allocation is recommended for each bucket. More than half of the books recommend that an investor's asset allocation should become more conservative with age. Nine side a variant of the portfolio percent in stocks should be 100 minus your age rule. These rules create a hump-shaped pattern of portfolio equity share with respect to age. The young often need access to their savings in the near term, so most of their financial assets will be in bonds. The middle-aged have more savings, so a greater allocation to equities will occur. Older individuals have a lower equity allocation because more of their money will be needed in the near term to fund retirement consumption. Economic models also recommend equity allocations that are hump-shaped with age, but for quite different reasons. Economists think less in terms of the probability of stocks having a positive return over longer periods of time, and more in terms of the variance of returns. Samuelson and Merton proved in a 1969 paper that if an investor has a constant relative risk aversion utility and no labour income, the optimal allocation to the stock market does not vary with the investment horizon. A big difference between economists and popular authors is that economists don't focus on the absolute level of interest rates in order to make their decisions, instead focusing on the difference between expected risky asset returns and the risk-free interest rate. This is known as the equity risk premium. Economists care more about how much extra you're being paid to take additional risk rather than just the level of interest rates at a given point in time. Economists additionally think of labour income as being like a bond interest payment that's relatively uncorrelated with stock returns. For this reason, they argue that someone with a steady income has an implicit fixed income position whose value is usually enormous relative to that person's financial assets. As the person ages, the present value of future labour income declines because there are fewer wage payments remaining. To offset the decline in implicit fixed income holdings, the financial portfolio should hold more fixed income over time. The fact that an individual has the ability to somewhat adjust how much they work also increases their capacity to bear financial risk 
when they're young, because a low investment return can be offset by working longer hours to make up the difference. If the young have more labour supply flexibility than the old, then this is another reason for the young to hold a greater share of stocks in their portfolios than the old do. Despite the importance of human capital, only eight popular books mention it as a relevant consideration for life cycle asset allocation. Economists consider risk aversion as being driven by the speed at which marginal utility diminishes as consumption increases. This is the idea that once you're above a certain level of spending or income, you don't get as much extra happiness out of each additional dollar that you have available to spend. This diminishing marginal utility means that the upside potential of a gamble is not as attractive, making gambling type investment strategies less attractive to investors. Only a few of the books suggest that diminishing marginal utility should be a determinant of one's portfolio equity share. On the topic of dividends and interest income, the popular authors and academics really disagree. Academics will point out that when a company pays a dividend, the price of the stock will fall by the amount of the dividend paid. If a company had a million dollars of cash in its bank account and paid that out to investors as dividends, the company is now worth a million dollars less. The money has been paid out. On top of that, though, dividends and interest payments are disadvantaged relative to capital gains in the US tax code, which makes the prevalence of dividends a puzzle to economists. Nine of the books in the sample reject the dividend irrelevance theorem, and no book recommends issuing dividends or interest for tax reasons. Multiple books refer to the need for income, particularly when the investor is older, for which bonds are the preferred source. Kiyosaki entirely dismisses the relevance of capital gains altogether, arguing that cash flow from the investment is the only relevant factor. In the long run, when taxes are taken into account, dividend paying stocks tend to underperform non-dividend paying stocks. It might make sense to keep dividend paying stocks in tax sheltered accounts like retirement accounts rather than in your taxable investment account for this reason. More than half of the popular books studied recommend equity style tilts, either to value stocks, growth stocks, or small cap stocks. The books don't suggest that these style tilts could entail taking on more risk, which suggests that most authors think that their recommended tilts generate superior risk adjusted returns. Many of the books suggest switching styles when you know a given style is more likely to do well, like in a recession or in a recovery. Academic literature discusses how various factor outperformances are possibly driven by additional risk being taken on by investors. Many of the books have something to say about international equity investment. Only two books recommend not diversifying internationally at all. Most books give no reasoning for why they underweight international stocks. Seven books say that international stocks are riskier than US stocks, citing currency risk, lower liquidity, subpar accounting and financial transparency standards, and political instability. The motives for underweighting international stocks that do appear in popular books tend to be rejected by economists. A security's expected return is tied to its discount rate, regardless of its expected cash flow growth. Therefore, the perceived strength of the US economy is not a reason to overweight it if the market is efficiently pricing this strength. The academics and popular financial authors, as I mentioned earlier, mostly recommend index fund investing, and they do this for similar reasons. Authors that recommend active investment management 
generally recommend picking funds based on their past performance, but evidence that fund performance persists is quite weak. The agreement between popular advice and economists' advice may be due to the fact that the statistics on average performance and performance persistence are straightforward to calculate, easy to understand, and widely publicized. Another big difference between academics and popular personal finance authors is on the topic of non-mortgage debt. For economists, a very basic principle of optimal debt repayment is to prioritize paying down the debt, charging the highest interest rate first. This is simple mathematics. But in practice, households often don't follow this principle. Surprisingly, many of the personal finance authors don't recommend this fairly obvious approach at all. Nine of the books studied endorse some version of Dave Ramsey's debt snowball method. The debt snowball prioritizes paying off the smallest balance debt first while making the minimum required payment on the other loans. When the smallest balance debt is paid off, the money that was being applied towards it now goes towards paying off the next smallest balance debt, and so on until all debts are paid off. Dave Ramsey writes, People sometimes say, but Dave, doesn't it make sense mathematically to pay off the highest interest rates first? Maybe, but if you were doing math, you wouldn't have credit card debt to begin with, would you? This is about behavior modification. Now, I would counter to Dave that they've bought your book because you were supposed to be helping them with the math. Making a deliberate mistake today because you made a different mistake in the past doesn't make any sense to me at all. Ramsey argues that you need some quick wins or you'll lose steam and get discouraged. Every time you cross a debt off the list, you get more energy and momentum. With a similar eye towards motivation, two books of the book studied recommend prioritizing the debt that bothers you the most, regardless of its interest rate. Once again, I'd argue that the part of the debt that should bother you the most is the interest rate. This is simple mathematics. I don't think I'd make a very good financial self-help guru, unfortunately. Another big difference that Choi found is that economists don't understand the idea of holding cash in a low interest rate account while also having high interest rate debt. 14 of the books that Choi analyzed endorse co-holding or having cash savings at the same time as high interest rate debt, but for very different reasons. Some recommend it as it prevents borrowing additional amounts. I guess this is tied to the idea that taking out new loans can be an addiction. Four books refer to the motivation created by building assets even while paying down debt. One author writes, if you were to direct all of your available cash flow to debt reduction, it might literally be years before you could begin saving for the future. This is too negative, so negative in fact, that many people who follow this path get discouraged, give up early, and never get to the savings part. Okay, so mortgages next. Most of the personal financial books studied advise that adjustable rate mortgages are riskier than fixed rate mortgages, with the discussion almost entirely focusing on the fluctuating monthly payments of adjustable rate mortgages. Academic literature argues that fixed rate mortgages are exposed to inflation rate risk and that adjustable rate mortgages are exposed to the risk that real or inflation adjusted interest rates will change. Academics argue that individuals can protect themselves against a drop in inflation by refinancing a fixed rate mortgage, but that many fixed rate mortgage borrowers fail to refinance optimally. Essentially, the academics are arguing that either choice involves some risk. Very few of the books studied mention that fixed rate mortgages are exposed to inflation risk, meaning that 
fixed rate borrowers do worse in low inflation scenarios and better in scenarios of unexpectedly high inflation. The two books that mention inflation only see this exposure as advantageous, either as a hedge or as a profit opportunity. Academics argue that borrowers should generally prefer adjustable rate over fixed rate mortgages, except in situations where interest rates are unusually low to begin with. Academic research has found that adjustable rate mortgages can work out better for borrowers during recessions, as short-term interest rates tend to fall more than long-term interest rates during recessions, and fixed rate mortgages require the borrower to refinance in order to get payment relief, which they might be unable to do if their home value has fallen enough to cause maximum loan-to-value requirements to bind. In recent years, both the academics and the personal finance gurus would have advised the same thing, fixed rate mortgages, but for very different reasons. In different macroeconomic environments, their advice would likely clash. The personal finance book authors give different recommendations as to how large your home down payment should be, with some suggesting that you should buy a home with only a 5% down payment in order to become a homeowner earlier, and others recommend at least a 20% down payment. Most of the authors recommend 30-year mortgages, with Dave Ramsey being an outlier recommending a 15-year loan. Many of the books recommend paying off your mortgage early, citing the emotional reward of living debt-free. Only a few of the books give advice on when to refinance a fixed rate mortgage, with most giving the rule that you should do so if rates fall by more than 1%. The academics give more nuanced, if more difficult to follow advice on this front. Academic research advises either buying a smaller home or putting less money down in a risk-shifting model if you are more pessimistic about expected housing returns. The optimal strategy for refinancing a mortgage from academia is complicated because of the option value of waiting for the interest rate to potentially fall further before paying the refinancing cost. The interest rate threshold for refinancing depends on the standard deviation of the mortgage interest rate, the cost of refinancing, the discount rate for future cash flows, the outstanding mortgage balance, the marginal tax rate against which mortgage interest can be deducted, and the expected time until the borrower will sell the home. I guess the problem is that an optimized solution is just going to be complicated and rely on things like options pricing theory, which can't be easily explained to the average homeowner who's busy with their day-to-day -day life. With regard to quickly buying a home with a low down payment in order to avoid wasting money on rent, most economists would point out that in such a situation, you're either renting the home or renting the money you used to buy the home. Choi concludes in his paper that popular financial advice can deviate significantly from economic theory, often due to a number of fallacies. But he argues that popular financial advice has a few strengths relative to economic theory. First, the recommended actions made by personal financial authors is often easily understood by ordinary individuals. There's no need to solve a complex dynamic programming problem in order to optimize refinancing your mortgage. Second, the financial guru's advice considers difficulties individuals have in following a financial plan due to limited motivation or their own emotional barriers. He argues that popular financial advice may, even if it's not always perfect, be more practically useful to the ordinary individual just because it's easier to follow. To wrap this up, my favorite Finfluencer story of the week is that FTX, the now bankrupt crypto exchange, allegedly approached Taylor Swift with a $100 million sponsorship deal to make her a Finfluencer. 
The talks allegedly fell through when Swift asked the FTX representatives for assurance that they were not dealing in unregistered securities. It would appear that she has more sophisticated advisors than many of the big finfluencers out there who are now facing lawsuits over the FTX collapse. If you enjoyed this video, you should watch this one next on YouTubers that have been charged with securities fraud. Don't forget to check out our sponsor Aura using the link in the video description below. Have a great day and see you in the next video. Bye.